Hey, welcome back to The Dive. Today on the show, we're happy to have back the founder and CEO of independent speculator Lobo Tigre. He's back on to discuss the State of the Union Address, the job market, oil, chat GPT, mining stocks, precious metals, and uranium. Hey, Lobo, welcome back to The Dive. Thank you so much for joining us today. Good to see you again, Cassandra. Happy to be here. Good to see you too. Okay, so Lobo, Joe Biden acknowledged in his State of the Union address that inflation is a global problem. He then stressed that inflation has been coming down over the last six months. Where do you think that the U.S. is in the battle with inflation right now? And what are your thoughts on the State of the Union address? I would say it was an excellent demonstration of the state of the disunion, especially if you consider the Republican rebuttal. And I have to say, while I was sympathetic to what uh, Ms. Huckabee said, and Biden came across as more presidential. Like his his talk, while it was pure BS and spin, was still, you know, big tent, we're all in this together, let's finish the job, you know, rah, rah. Whereas what Huckabee had to say was only of interest to her side. Like, you know, the other side would just completely not hear anything but you know, hate speech or whatever they want to call it. So I'm not sure, I'm not sure either side has any shot at being affected as, as disunionized as the country has become. Um, and maybe that's not where you want to go. We're here to talk about investments and things, but I, I think it's important. The, the country's in real trouble. There's, there's no healing this breach that I can see, not anytime soon. And that's a serious issue. But anyway, so yeah, inflation is a global thing. You know, it's nice to to be able to say it's not my fault. Ha- can't have anything to do with the trillions that we spent. Or to be fair, his predecessor also spent. The you know the point is that the the money printing and yes, I get that it's more than physical money printing. It does matter. It did have the foreseeable consequences, and um, you know the fact that other governments around the world did the same doesn't excuse the United States or doesn't make our own problems less important. Now, I'm not just speaking as an American, um, but as a as an investor, as a speculator, what matters here is to keep our eye on the ball and that yes, you know, always and everywhere, monetary phenomenon, consequences do follow from actions. The the largesse that we saw, there's still a lot of pig to work through the Python. And the number one thing is you know, they're, they're bringing back that tired old uh, word disinflation. You know, if ever there was a more bogus and deceptive piece of jargon, you know, foisted on the public by the economists of the world, that's got to be one of them and one of the worst. You know, disinflation, oh, it sounds like, you know, deflation. It's, things are getting better. No, disinflation means that it's getting worse less quickly, right? It's a decrease in the increase. It's not a decrease. It's not even a stop. It's just not increasing as much as it was before, but it's still increasing. Um, so many ways we could go from that, Cassandra, but basically, dear audience, you know, don't be fooled. Disinflation is not deflation. You probably know that, but it's also just not good news. Um, though, if you are a metals uh, investor, especially if you're a gold or silver bug, it may be good news because if it means the Fed will ease up on the break or even reapply the accelerator, that will be very bullish for gold and silver prices. Now we're seeing lots of tech layoff news, but unemployment is at a 50 year low. What is your read on what's happening in the job market? Well, that's another big, huge can of worms, Cassandra, but in the first place, employment is a lagging indicator. Everybody knows that even the Democrats and the people in the administration understand that it's a lagging indicator. So it, there's not as much a contradiction as it would seem between the layoffs we've been seeing over the last month and the report, which is which is uh, lagging. Um, the other thing is that in the context, if you look at the fuller context of the very low labor force participation rate, you know it's easier to have a lower unemployment rate if fewer people count as not working. And they talk about how oh it's people retired early and so on. Well. People may have retired early, but if inflation eats away their savings and they have to come back in labor force, that was just a, a transitory uh, early retirement. You know that they're not off the hook. And there's also plenty of disillusioned workers. There's a 
plenty of buzz out there, even in mainstream financial media, about you know prime working age men not coming back to the marketplace, the labor market. So I think the number, even within the bounds of mainstream. Oh, one more thing. If you look at this blowout jobs report we had, you know, the lion's share of the new jobs created were service sector, like hospitality, like flipping burgers and and you know swilling cocktails at the bar and stuff. You know, and the layoffs that we're seeing are high are high paying tech jobs, white collar jobs, most of not all. We've seen manufacturing and other layoffs. So it's it's not true that it's all tech layoffs. But if you look at the balance of what we're losing and what we're getting, this is not good. It's a downgrade for the economy. Um, and if that's what's happening, it may even be doubly false. The number of people taking on second jobs, uh, you know, the people you've been taking on two full-time jobs, those numbers are up. I, I think it's very misleading to just look at the unemployment rate. And even the Fed, you know, will say, you know, we need to pay close, uh, close attention to the labor force participation rate. So, you know, much ballyhoo, I think the powers that be know of it even if they want to spin it a certain way in the medium and the media accomplices, you know, here I sound like I should put a tin foil hat on, you know, but it's, it's not as it seems. I mean, this, this is, you're not crazy, dear audience. You know, there is bad stuff happening and in the end reality matters and it will become evident. And I think, you know, not someday someone, you know, Linus in the pumpkin patch. I think this year, uh, I think the pain will become very evident. And either I'm right or I'm wrong, but you know we'll find out soon enough. Okay, now according to Goldman Sachs, oil will rise back above a hundred dollars a barrel this year, and may face a serious supply problem in 2024. Where do you think oil is heading over the near term? Huh. Well, you say Goldman Sachs, you really mean Jeff Curry, who's the senior commodities analyst there, or I'm not sure exactly what his title is, but Jeff's been pretty good uh, for years, actually. I think, you know, he's not a, a hardcore gold bug like me, but I think he has a pretty realistic outlook. So I, I do place some weight on his comments there. Uh, I have written uh, later last year that I think that triple digit oil prices are going to be the new normal. It doesn't mean it can't dip back down as it has. Um, but I I think that's where the world is gonna going to be. And if you look at just sort of the big macro, we've got, the new Iron Curtain, this war, the whole energy landscape has changed. And I think that's supportive for higher gold price, sorry, oil prices ahead. But then on top of that, you've got the reopening. You've got the probable pivot of not just the Fed, but really everybody as soon as the recession brown stuff hits the fan. So there's turbulence ahead. My, my, my writing and my guidance for my audience has long been, uh, or for the last few months has been, I'm not buying any oil. Uh, place right now. I'm not buying any gas plays at all, but oil, I think we can expect really high volatility in the near term as these forces war, the recession versus the reopening. Um, but in due course, I do think the, the China reopening and the money printing and the fiscal and monetary response to the recession is uh, very bullish for oil prices. And as I say, I think the new normal is going to be triple digit oil prices going forward. Of course, other prices will rise. So, what does what does one hundred twenty dollars oil mean if eggs are eight dollars and everything else? That you know, still, um, that's my outlook. It's kind of strange, Cassie. I, I I feel like there's something wrong in the world if I'm agreeing with Goldman Sachs, but it's Jeff Curry. <laughs> Not exactly Goldman Sachs. I got it. Okay, so let's change gears a bit here. We know that you're not a big tech guy, but we would like to get your thoughts on chat GPT since it's all over the headlines. Now, from someone who writes and does due diligence, what are your thoughts on AI powered tools? Have you tried using them? I have actually, I, I wrote an article about, I remember the title, something with the AI is coming or, I mean, this is a real thing. So I, I'm laughing here as you're asking the question because <laughs> there's so much you know, nonsense about this. We've got, I was just seeing, and even on, on Yahoo Finance, which is pretty mainstream, you talk about tech, there was one of the presenters there who was saying, boy, this is a lot like blockchain. When all kinds of companies that had nothing to do with blockchain started talking about blockchain and their, and their share prices were double. I remember Kodak of all 20th century companies said they were going to do something with blockchain and the stock price of Kodak doubled on that news. And of course, nothing really happened. 
So this AI thing looks like that. People are talking AI, anything with AI in the name, ETFs with AI. Doesn't matter whether the AI, AI works, how good it is, how useful it is. You know, anything AI, money has just piled into this and that's very dangerous. So the first thing I would say to the audience is if you haven't succumbed to FOMO already, be very, very wary. I always think it's best to resist FOMO. If you have piled in with everybody else and you have gains, it, realize them. You know, you don't, <laughs> it's a paper gain is, is not a gain until you take some profits. You know, and if you have better than a double, you can get all of your money back off the table and still leave some, you know, as much as you started with on the bet in case it does go to the moon without risk. That is well worth doing. Um, but to answer your question, so this is a real thing. And I do think it becomes a game changer. You say I'm not a tech guy, but I have said that at some point, if it ever got down to a reasonable PE, I could see buying shares of Tesla not as an automaker, but as a tech company that is also working on AI. Elon has said that to really resolve full self-driving, they need a human level AI. Uh, if they can do that, then they won't have to hire an actor to wear a robot suit and say, here's our robot. <laughs> and uh, you know that, that would be a true game changer. Um, I don't see that yet in chat GPT. I see a fairly useful tool that's better than um, some fairly dumb so-called smart systems out there, but it's not creative. You know, it, it may be able to create original content following formulas in a formulaic way, but when you interact with it, you see it, you ask it related questions, and it will frequently start with the same boilerplate text. Like, you know, well, I'm not in a position to say this, that, or the other. Always consult the financial advisor. And if you look at the kinds of things that you know, people are all excited about chat GPT is already doing and taking these jobs, it's very menial, repetitive, I think not very creative work. Like the big example we hear a lot about is real estate agents are using it to create listing you know, text for house listing. That's about the most uncreative, mundane, you know, cut, paste, repeat kind of writing that I can think of. So it makes sense to me that a robot could do that fairly well. Um, I, when I did test it, I asked it about things that I know a little bit about, you know, the copper market, gold, that sort of thing. And my feeling was that the answers were like what you would get from a lazy eighth grader if he decided to go on the internet and look for answers for his homework instead of actually thinking about and researching the issue. So, uh, you know, all these people that are worried about their jobs being lost to chat GPT, well... I can see it for jobs that don't require a great deal of originality or creativity, maybe. Um, but maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's the, the sort of thing that robots should do so that people have more time to do, you know, real value adding work. You know, every time there's something like this, people are afraid, it's, you know, it's going to be mass unemployment. We're all going to, you know, we're all going to be out of the street because the robots are going to take our jobs. But every time something like this happens, it creates a whole new area an open area for people to apply themselves that the robots or the machines before, the, you know, the looms before that the Luddites wanted to smash back in the 1800s. You know, it creates more opportunity. And I, you know, think about what I said. The kind of menial robotic stuff that a, a robot would be better at doing gets replaced. Well, what does that mean? It means that the human beings can then focus on more interesting work. I think that's actually a very positive thing. If the world ends up needing people to be, you know, artists and, and all kinds of things. You know, what a wonderful world where the robots can do the grunt work and people can focus on more, you know, interesting and beauty enhancing work. So you mentioned in one of your most recent Speculators Digest that you think revaluation of the best mining stocks will happen this year or next if it takes the Fed that long to pivot. Could you give us some more color on this? Well, the idea there is that a long established pattern isn't just me. This is something that resource speculators have known for decades. You know, why do we even bother with these crappy mining stocks? That's a technical definition handed down to me by Doug Casey. Um, because they offer leverage to the underlying commodities. It, it's classic. We've seen this over the years and years and years. Like gold goes up 1%. The mining stocks will go up 4 or 5%. The juniors might go up 10%, 20% that same day with no nothing different in the company just based on levers to the underlying commodity. So what we've noticed is that over the last year plus, the mining stocks have disconnected from the commodity. They haven't, you know, it's, it's broken. Something's not working. 
they haven't offered, or on average, they have offered less leverage than one would expect to the commodities. And particularly in 2022, the Bloomberg Commodities Index was actually positive for the year. But if you look at the big mining proxies, you know, the GDX or, you know, these, these indices that track mining stocks, um, they're down for the year. So there's been this disconnect between the mining stocks and the metals at least, or commodities in general. And I think that's an opportunity. I understand that, you know, people are worried about the recession. I mean, it makes sense. Metals prices get hit in the recession. So I understand people being reluctant to go into the mining stocks if you think a recession, like as I do, you know, it makes sense to be cautious about that. And also we had this huge run up before and for things to cool, of course, you know, people want to take some profits, get some money back off the table, step out of harm's way potentially. So it kind of makes sense. But if you look at the basic facts, the numbers, um, it's an aberration for the stocks to underperform in a rising commodities environment. And I just don't think that lasts. So, but I'm not just saying, oh, well, the theory says, or it's also partly psychology here. I just can't see a place, a, an environment in which the commodities, particularly the metals, continue to rise. And after the damage from the recession is done, I do think they will. Question is, sooner or later. So that to answer like why now or this year versus 2024, if the Chinese reopening is enough to push commodities up in the face of the recession, then I think we get that reset this year. And once people realize, oh, this is happening. Oh, metals are not going away. Oh, you know, the, the green agenda requires more copper than we have. All these things come to come to bear. I think we can see the stocks start offering that leverage, which is our reason for speculating on them in the first place. And if it doesn't happen this year with China's reopening, I think then the recession itself causes the pivot globally and new fiscal and monetary stimuli, which will push commodities prices and then the leverage. You know, everybody will see that writing on the wall too. And I think we'll see the leverage come back. So sooner or later, I do think this historically very well documented, strong relationship does come back. And that's very good for people who have the intestinal fortitude to buy you know, when things are on sale. Now, Newmont made a non-binding offer to acquire Newcrest Mining at $17 billion. However, the Newcrest board deemed the initial proposal would not deliver sufficiently compelling value to Newcrest shareholders and rejected the first offer. Do you think that this could start to attract more capital into the precious metal space? I'm actually a bit on the fence about this. I, you know, I want to say yes. You know, we've been waiting for this big wage wave of M and A's to come in and, and start uh, start to really take you know take over offers for our crappy little junior mining stocks that we love so much. Um, and it just hasn't happened. We saw quite a bit of consolidation before when both Newmont and Barrick bought out their you know other biggest rivals and you know so. Usually you get some consolidation at the top, it trickles down to the mid-tier, and then it should continue on down to the juniors, where, where I mostly speculate. Um, but that didn't happen, really, not in any noticeable way. So I'm not sure that this really will, you know, this consolidation will, will do much. I think the more interesting question is really is, will there be a bidding war? I mean, Newcrest doesn't need to be taken over. It's fine. It makes money doesn't need Newmont. It's it's not a rescue case or a turnaround or something. So, um, you know, they have every reason to push back and see if another suitor comes along or or just to, to remain on their own. They don't they don't need Newmont. But that would be quite interesting because if Newmont does buy Newcrest, you know, that's going to leave Barrick so much farther behind in the dust. I mean, it, right now you have the world's second and largest and they're roughly comparable. But if Newmont buys Newcrest, it you know, Barrick might have to buy like two other companies or, or Agnico or I don't know, something else to, to even keep close to keeping up. So we could see more consolidation at the top. Um, I don't know that that would really make for any big wins for resource speculators. You know, these the consolidation amongst the majors, it doesn't tend to have that kind of like 50 to 100% premium that we like and take over for a junior. Um for what it's worth, you know, it, it, we'll see. It. The other thing, though, I guess one final thought on this is, 
even if the this particular takeover doesn't tell us a whole lot about you know the prospects for the industry as a whole and don't forget that mining by definition is kind of a, a, a self-destroying business any deposit you have the more you mine it the less you have left left of it you have to go out and make more discoveries and if you've slashed your exploration budget because of you know, COVID shutdowns or metal prices fluctuations or whatever, because of a need to clean up your balance sheet as the majors had, you know, coming off the excesses of 10 plus years ago, um, then you're just not replacing the ounces that you're mining. You're becoming a self-depleting business. So you can only do so much M&A before you have to go out and discover more or buy the people who have. So whether this thing right now, Cassie, means anything, um, I think in due course, we will see more M and A because the the exploration budgets and the discovery pace just hasn't kept up. So I think I think that's coming, and I think it's going to do very well for people who can spit good a spot, good potential takeover targets. According to the World Gold Council, central banks added just over eleven hundred tons of gold, worth around seventy billion dollars, to their stockpiles in twenty twenty two by far the most since 1950. Why do you think central banks are increasing their gold purchases now? Well, you know, they don't really tell us, so we can only theorize, and I think that's of only limited value. There are a lot of exciting theories that we like to believe in, one of the very popular ones, which may even be true, by the way. I'm not saying that you're, you're a tinfoil hat wearer if you believe X, Y, or Z. I'm just saying there's a difference between what we know and what we guess, imagine, think, even deduce. So a very popular one is that the BRICS countries are loading up on gold to um, to back a non-dollar international currency. And that might even happen. I, I could absolutely see that happening, not overnight, not anytime soon. Uh, but like if you're China and you know that people around the world are not going to trust the yuan the way they did the dollar, particularly if you, you continue to have a command and control economy and a system that is not fully transparent then adding something like gold to back such a currency would, would give credence, would give internationally, you know, the, the value of gold is not something that the Communist Party of China can control or manipulate, uh, at least not, not much. Um, not more, I don't want to trip myself up here. Let's not get into that can of worms. All I'm saying is I could see this happening, but I don't know that it will. And we'll never know until it's a historical fact after the fact. I think there's a more immediate uh, probable cause that that makes a lot of sense to me. And that's just after what happened in 2022, when the U.S. cut Russia off the SWIFT system, which I, I'm, not, I'm not criticizing that or saying that was wrong. I, I oppose the war in Ukraine. Um, but everybody and everybody had to say, like, holy beep, like that never happened before. Even when Russia took Crimea, you know, bad things have happened before. This was, this was, a, it was called before it happened, the nuclear option. That's how big a deal this was. And this is the sort of thing that central banks around the world will go, well, holy cow, if that can happen to them, it could happen to us. And even if, you know, it makes sense, you could say, oh, well, China and North Korea, of course, they're going to think that. But why would, why would the United Arab Emirates or Hungary or some other country that's not necessarily in the axis of evil <laughs> you know, why would they fear the United States? Well, it's not so much that they think they're, they're about to be blacklisted, but it's just like, wow, that could happen. That is something worth hedging against. It, it's not like they're, they're going to join North Korea in some new alliance. It's just like, wow, that is a risk that we know how to mitigate. We can do something about that risk. So the central bank gold buying of 2022 makes perfect sense to me. And, um, I, you know, and that's there's no reason to think that ends on January 1st. So it brings an additional source of demand to the table that, you know, that's good news for gold bucks. Okay, now let's move on and talk about uranium. What is your read on the uranium market right now? <laughs> well, impatient uranium bugs that you keep saying, it's still stuck at 50. What's wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong? But I, I don't know that I have anything really new for you to say here, Cassie. Just, just pull back and look at the big picture. 
we have a two steps forward, one step back sawtooth pattern that's been going upwards for five years now plus. And that trend is not broken. There's, I don't think there's anything wrong with uranium. I think the things to keep in mind are that, you know, spot is volatile. It plays around. But at the end of the day, you know, reality matters. The Japanese are restarting reactors. And, and beyond that, going, you know, more fully pro-nuclear, looking at new advanced reactor designs and things like that. It's huge. And it's not just a, a someday this might matter kind of thing. You know, like we might build advanced reactors and it might take 10 years for this to come to market. No, Japan has reactors now, idle reactors now that can create demand now. So that's a big deal. My friend Rick Rule likes to focus on that. Personally, I've been more focused on the long-term contracting. This is also happening now. This is one of my big mantras. Forget about inevitable, forget about imminent. I want happening now. And the long-term contracting is happening now. And while the lowest cost producers and the people who stockpile, you know, some of these clever fellows that bought uranium off the spot market at $30 a pound are now able to turn around and sell it at $50 a pound. So, you know, for a while, there can be a bit of arbitrage here. But there's only so much uranium the, the hoarders, stockpilers, and the low-cost producers can provide. It's not enough to keep the market in balance. So the long-term contract prices, you know, once they start coming out and getting revealed, there are a lot of them being signed that, that are still confidential. Uh, but I think we're going to see the long-term price move higher. I think it has to. And the spot price never ignores that for long. So I'm, I'm really quite bullish. There's, even in the face of uh, recession, I think uranium is different from other forms of energy. It's more recession resistant. I would call it recession proof, but recession resistant, base load power. We need that no matter what. Um, and again, the reality is that the mine supply has been insufficient for years and it cannot become sufficient without higher uranium prices. So absent a Chernobyl level event, uh, this is a very high confidence thesis for me. And I have an unusually large portion of my portfolio in uranium stocks right now. And it is one of the few things that I would be willing to buy to put more money into right now. Um, there's a new physical fund from Kazakhstan planning their IPO and will be buying directly from Kaz Adam Prom. If they really go public, what impact might this have on the uranium market? Well, any new buyer is a good thing, but I, I don't know the details of that one, but as I looked at it, I didn't see that it would become quite the source of sequestration that the Sprott vehicle did. I mean, the Sprott guys, at least for now, I mean, that uranium can't come back on the market. They would have to go to the shareholders and approve a change of their business before they could flip from buying to selling. I'm not sure that's the case with Kazadam, uh, this new whatever Kazadam problem offspring will be. In fact, I, I think it is not the case. So. You know, while they do that, it is it's in the interest of Kaz Adam Palm for them to buy uranium and just sit on it. Uh, but if they don't have to, and they can make money doing otherwise, they that could become a swing player that helps sometimes, hurt sometimes. So, net net, you know, good to see this kind of interest. It's 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 good that there's even an investment case for this sort of thing at all beyond one. It tells you something about the broader uranium market. But you know, I'm not gonna build a model on on how much this is going to change the price of uranium in five years or something. I, I think that's uh, beyond knowing. Okay. Well, Lobo, that is all we have for you today. Before we let you go, could you please let our audience know where they can go to find more of your commentary? Sure. Well, we've got, uh, I think, free content on almost everything that you've asked about on the website, which is independentspeculator.com. And I'll just quickly say, if you sign up for our free weekly digest. We will not spam you to death with a flood of daily advertisements. You get one email per week and you can unsubscribe anytime you like. Okay. Sounds great. Well, thank you so much for coming on today, Lobo. It's always a pleasure getting to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Till next time. To our audience at home, thank you so much for tuning in today. We will be back again tomorrow with another interview that you're not going to want to miss. So be sure to stay tuned by hitting that notification bell and subscribing to our channel below before you leave us. Bye.